This evening, uh, we are going to complete, as you've already heard, the uh, Ten Commandments. And what I'd like to do is simply read Exodus 20, verse 17, and then we'll jump over to 1 Timothy 6, and I'd like to read that chapter as well. We read in Exodus 20, verse 17, You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And then switching over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, realizing that Paul wrote this to Timothy, we understand that he's not the only one, of course, that can receive from this instruction. These things would apply to us, at least as they are able to be applied to us. We read in verse 1, All those who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith and take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to be, or to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter, and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith, grace be with you. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing this evening. Again, um, Paul reminds Timothy that we didn't bring anything into the world. We certainly can't take anything out of it except the things that we give to the Lord, the things we use for His glory while we're here. Those are the only things that we can take out of this world, which is why we are to be rich in good works, because the Lord, as we saw this morning, will reward us for those things. God is not so unjust as to forget our love, and the service we have shown 
to his people. But again, we're focusing this evening on the idea of contentment. And we've seen, of course, through numerous things, that if we are to follow the example that Jesus gave us, and going back a little bit further, if we are to be the kind of person that pleases God and catches His eye, we do need to love Him. We need to love Him as Jesus loved Him, with our whole heart. Our lives need to be centered on serving God. And as our Lord tells us, the second greatest commandment, we must love others as we love ourselves. And that's really what we're looking at in the commandments. The first four telling us how we are to love God, and the last six telling us how we are to love our neighbors. Loving others, we've seen loving our neighbor means that we must honor that authority that the Lord places over us, that we must protect the lives of others, that we must protect their purity, that we must protect their possessions, and we must protect their reputation. Now, the last way the Lord would have us to love our neighbor is by not coveting or desiring what they have. He says, not their house, not their wife, spouse, not their male or female servant, their ox or their donkey, which I think we won't have too much trouble in the present time doing that. But notice he says, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So this evening, I want us to consider three things. First of all, the Lord does not want you to desire what others have. Secondly, the cure for covetousness, which is contentment. And then thirdly, how contentment really is the key to being happy in whatever situation we're in. So first of all, let's just consider briefly that the Lord does not want you to desire what others have. Now, we might wonder why we can't want what they have and how wanting what other people have uh, inevitably injures them. And I think it does so certainly in a few ways. We understand that, and it's interesting that the Lord would separate this commandment out of the rest because we've looked at, as we've looked at the other commandments, we understand that they can be uh, broken uh, in our imaginations, they can be broken in our hearts as well as in reality, and yet this particular commandment is telling us not to covet or to desire in our hearts and minds what other people have. In other words, this is actually regulating our thoughts and our hearts because this is really where it all begins, isn't it? This is where, you might say, the, the beginning of the breaking of the commandments. For instance, if we desired our neighbor's house, we would be desiring or mentally or in our hearts stealing from them or desiring to steal what they have if we wanted what they had. Now, it might not be as bad to want a house like their house, uh, although we're going to, to look at that also in a moment, but to want the one that they actually have, I think that's what this commandment is specifically addressing means that if we were to have it, they wouldn't have it. It would be injuring them in our hearts. And certainly the same thing would be true of any of their belongings. To desire those things, literally, is to break the Eighth Commandment. You shall not steal in your heart. What about wanting their wife? What about wanting their husband? That does occur, as you know. Well, that is a violation of the Seventh Commandment. To desire another man's wife or a, a, a woman, to desire another, man, another woman's husband, is to commit adultery in, their, in our hearts. Uh, if we desire something else about them, if we want perhaps their looks, perhaps we're jealous of their looks or their gifts or their position or maybe the honor that they have in this world, Paul tells us that that is clearly not to love them. He says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, and love is not jealous. Coveting anything that our neighbor has violates them. It violates them in our mind. It violates them in our hearts. It causes resentment. It causes jealousy. 
And you realize when you resent your neighbor and you're jealous of your neighbor, that is really a prelude to treating them poorly. And certainly, the possibility of breaking the other commandments is there. You are not to covet what they have. Now, the commandment actually requires more of us, as we know, than just this. Not only are you not to desire what other people have or desire to to take it away from them or to have it for yourself, regardless of whether it be possessions or relationships or various other things such as uh, natural abilities and gifts, but you are actually called upon to be happy that the Lord has blessed them with these things. The Bible says that you are to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And certainly, you know, you, you might ask yourself the question, well, what would you want for yourself? I think most of us desire good things. We want good things for ourselves. We want a good house. We want a, a faithful spouse. I mean, sometimes as we think about, for instance, you know, the, uh, the fact that Erica has just gotten married, uh, we're saddened by the fact that she's not here with us anymore. And now she's, well, I think she's probably on the other side of the United States by now. I think they caught an early uh, plane. And, you know, we might perhaps be tempted to maybe not like Jacob as much because he's taken somebody precious away from us. And yet, what is it that we would desire for ourselves if we were in her situation? Uh, wouldn't we want that happiness for ourselves? Wouldn't we want that relationship for ourselves, and we think of it in this way, that the Lord has really blessed Erica and blessed Jacob, then you see we can be happy for them uh, as we would be happy for ourselves if we were lacking that particular gift and the Lord gave that gift to us. We desire good things for ourselves, and we should desire then good things for other people if we are to love them. We are to desire good things for our neighbor. If they have money, we should be thankful the Lord gives them money. If He gives them uh, natural gifts that uh, are, are good, we should be thankful for that because we would desire that for ourselves, or spiritual gifts to serve the Lord. You see, if we love our neighbor as ourselves, then that's what we should want for our neighbor. We should want them to have good things. We can't really desire good things for our neighbor and want those things for ourselves at the same time. You realize, of course, that loving our neighbors ourself means, too, that if they didn't have these particular things, that love would move us to desire to meet those needs so that they might have them. Well, the fact that they have them already should make us then rejoice. Love desires what is good for our neighbor. And so not only are we not to covet what they have, or to be jealous of what they have, but we are actually to be happy for them, that the Lord has blessed them in this way because, again, loving our neighbors ourselves, this is what we would want for ourselves, so this is what we should want for them. If we don't feel that way, if we, if we do struggle with coveting, we really do need to step back and remember the Lord says, Love your neighbor as yourself and treat others the way you want to be treated. And if they have good things, we should be happy. But as I mentioned before, there is another principle uh, that is uh, implied here and certainly applied through Scripture, that not only are you not to covet or desire what they have and be happy with what the Lord has given to them, you also need to be content with what the Lord has given to to you. You see, you're only tempted to covet, I think, when you're not satisfied with what the Lord has given to you. Contentment is really the key to not coveting. It is the cure, you might say, to covetousness uh, and not being able to love your neighbor. You need to be content with what the Lord has given to you. Now, this is an area of, certainly that our, our young people have difficulty with in particular, but those of us who are older, you know, the, uh, the idea of keeping up with the Joneses and so forth, uh, the idea that there's other people who have things that we don't have. We do need to realize that God has given us what He has given us for a purpose, and He knows what we need, and we need to be thankful. You need to be content with how the Lord has actually made you. 
what He's made you to look like, uh, your build, your, your color, your, you know, your hair color, eye color, and so forth, things you could be unhappy with. God made you the way He did for a specific purpose. You need to be happy with where the Lord has placed you, uh, the family that you're born into, you know, the particular social and economic uh, status, as it were. I remember uh, growing up myself thinking, you know, wouldn't it have been nice to have been born into a family that had a lot of wealth? Uh, then I'd have all these things handed to me and I wouldn't have to worry about my future. I wouldn't have to, you know, uh, struggle with things that other people struggle with. And yet, the Lord put me where He wanted me to be and it was good where He put me and I needed to be happy with that, especially as we consider what we're going to be looking at in a moment. You need to be happy with the gifts God has given to you. Maybe you're not the greatest athlete in the world. Maybe you're not the most intelligent person in the world or the most gifted musician. And there's been a time when perhaps we've been unhappy with that you know, facet of our existence. But yet, God made us the way that He wanted us to be, and we need to be content with those gifts. We need to be content with our spiritual gifts, with the positions that He has given to us in life, the calling He has placed upon our lives. And even with the success or lack of success that the Lord grants to us, because really everything is according to His will and His good pleasure for a good reason. Now, how is it that we can be content? Well, I think we can be content, first of all, because we understand that God is sovereign and this is certainly uh, what He has intended for us and we know it's good and that's perhaps the most important uh, reason. Sometimes we can try to um, uh, maybe be more content with what we have as we look at what we have relative to other people. Sometimes we find some kind of comfort in that, that we may have less than some, but we have more than others. It's kind of like the man who complained that he had no shoes until he saw the man who had no feet. You've probably heard that before. Or like the man who complained he had no hat until he saw the man who had, uh, well, never mind. <laughs> but I think, <laughs> I think there's a better way of putting this into biblical perspective that will help us be more content than just where we are relative to other people. If you feel shorted because there's something that you don't have, or because of something that perhaps you may have lost, and again, as we grow, you know, as we go through this life, sometimes we do lose things, not only possessions, but sometimes body parts, sometimes faculties, right? You need to realize, I need to realize, that you and I don't deserve any of the things that we have in the first place, really. Everything that we possess is purely of God's grace. Some people are bitterly discontent because they lose a part of their body. And nobody really enjoys losing a member of their body. But if you do realize this, that none of us deserve really to have the members of our body. We don't deserve to have feet. We don't deserve to have legs or arms or really a body. Some people lose their senses and they're upset because perhaps they can't hear or they can't see. But you need to remember... We don't deserve any of those senses that, the God, uh, that God has given to us. We certainly don't deserve to be the kind of creatures that the Lord has made us. We are made in the image of God, and we have certain faculties that many of the creatures God made, don't, they don't have. We have an intellect that we might know the Lord. We have affections. We actually have moral capacity uh, to desire good or evil as we come into the world desiring sadly only evil, but the Lord re renewing our desire for good in regeneration. We have a will that can purpose and do various things. You see, we didn't deserve to be made into the image of God. We don't even really deserve to exist. The Lord didn't really have to give you any of these things. Certainly, we, didn't, we can't demand it from Him. He could just as easily have not made us as having made us, or He could have made us without some of these faculties. And you realize, too, that existing, we really don't deserve any of the good things that, that God gives to us in this world because of sin. 
We don't deserve any of the good gifts God has given to us. We don't even deserve the air that we have to breathe, the water we have to drink, the food we have to eat, the clothing we have to wear, or anything that God gives to sustain us. We don't deserve any of the abilities that God has given to us that allow us to work and to provide for ourselves and for our families. And we certainly don't deserve the spiritual gifts that God has given to us that allow us to be uh, servants to one another and blessings to one another. And we do not deserve the greatest gift that God has bestowed upon us, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ, His righteousness, His payment for our sins, His Holy Spirit to change our hearts and to give us an everlasting home and an inheritance in heaven. We don't deserve any of these things. What is it that we do deserve, having been made in the image of God and being in the situation that we are in in this world? Well, it's it's a hard pill to swallow for many people today, but those of us who do know the Lord and are convinced that what He says in His Word is true understand that what we do deserve, the only thing that you and I deserve, is judgment, is eternal punishment in hell. But you see, God hasn't given that to you, has He? Instead, He's given to you all these good things. You and I have far more than we really deserve. So how can we be angry that the Lord has not given us perhaps the things that we might want in this life? How can you hate other people because God has decided to give them more than He has given to you? You realize that that's entirely up to Him, and neither they nor we deserve any of it. And so instead of asking, why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? Why did He make me this way? Why did He make me that way? Instead, you should ask, why do I have anything? Why do I have anything good at all? I don't deserve it. I never really have deserved it. And just be thankful that you exist, to be thankful that, that, um, that you're on the earth at all and that you're the kind of creature that you are that can know the Lord. Be thankful that your needs are met. Be thankful that you have talents, natural abilities to take care of your needs and that you have gifts that you can use to serve and that your sins are forgiven and that your future is secure through the Lord Jesus Christ. I think if we looked at things in this way, perhaps we would covet less and be more thankful than we are. Now, you realize that um, looking at things in this way and, and being content not only cures covetousness, but it actually provides the key by which we can uh, be happy, we can be content, no matter what kind of a situation we happen to be in. Uh, Again, consider our meditation that Paul writes in Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Now, do you know where Paul was when he wrote this particular statement in Philippians 4 that we've just read? He was in a Roman prison. He he had his freedom taken away because of his preaching of the gospel. And yet, he could write um, this truth that he learned to be content, even in those circumstances, because he had more than he deserved. He had the true riches which are in heaven. Now again, how can we really be unhappy regardless of what happens to us when we deserve right now to be in agony? But not only are you not in agony, but your sins are forgiven, you have the righteousness of Christ, you have everything provided for you, you are the heirs of the kingdom of heaven, everything that Jesus Christ has earned. He is giving to you because you have trusted in Him. 
You are going to spend eternity with the Father and with your Lord, Jesus Christ, perfectly filled with the Spirit of God, living with Him as His sons and His daughters by adoption through Jesus Christ. Now, if you have all of this, again, in light of what you deserve, how can you complain when you, again, have everything that you need and, and more besides, even if you don't have as much as other people have? One thing that Jonathan Edwards um, said that I think is helpful to, again, promote happiness and promote contentment is the fact that God rarely makes His people wealthy. Uh, and I think the reason being is the... Um, one of the writers of the Proverbs says, "If when we're rich, we're tempted not to trust the Lord. Who is it that the Lord actually does make rich in the world? Jonathan Edwards asked, and the answer is, it's usually the wicked. He gives the wicked the things that he knows are not valuable. They're not the true riches and the things that ultimately will destroy them. You recall the, um, the parable of the rich man and, and Lazarus. The rich man received all of his good things here. That was his inheritance. But after he died, he lifted up his eyes in hell and he was in agony in these flames. While Lazarus was suffering while on the earth, he was a beggar at, at the gate, desiring the crumbs that fell from the table. And yet when he died, he was comforted in Abraham's bosom. He was enjoying the true blessings and the true riches of heaven, which God has stored up for those who love him, he had the true riches and he would have them forever. The rich man who was rich was rich only in this life. And after that, he had to suffer. So again, understanding what God has given to us gives us every reason to be content and every reason to be happy in every circumstance we have and every reason, again, not to covet what other people have. If you're content with what the Lord has given to you, how can you not love your neighbor and be happy for him because of what the Lord gives him? The only reason you're unhappy typically is because you, and, and you want what they have is because you're not happy with what you have and what the Lord has given to you. Why would anyone steal if he already has what it is that he would take? If you're already happy with what the Lord has given to you. If you're content with that, you don't need anything else. You can instead really look at how poor your rich neighbor is and those people who seem to have uh, the wealth of this world realize that they are receiving their inheritance as it were in full. But because they don't know the Lord, they're going to suffer for all eternity and really out of compassion for your neighbors who have these things, you should reach, reach out to them with the gospel to show them how they might have those things which are the true riches. And of course, realizing that we have these things, how can we not also look at our Christian neighbor and be thankful that the Lord has given him or her the things he has given for them to enjoy and to use for his glory? So contentment is the key to happiness. Contentment is the cure for covetousness. So remember how good the Lord has been to you and how much the Lord has given to you. And be thankful and be content. Now, this is going to go a long ways in helping you to love your neighbor as you should. Well, may the Lord give us uh, the grace uh, to do that. Let's, let's bow in a few moments of prayer and, and let's pray that God would help us again to see those riches, especially as we pre prepare to come to the table to see how rich we are, what, what God has given to us in His Son, the Lord Jesus.